Uh, so one note on the video, I've switched it from 1080 to 720. So hopefully the quality of the writing is still sufficient. So let me know if it's difficult to see the writing. When I reviewed the videos, it looked like the chalkboard is big enough on the screen. Then again, I've got a 27 inch monitor, so I'm kind of cheating a little bit. So let me know if we need to modify the resolution at all. The main issue is I don't know what goes on with the iPad, but I think the memory fills up. It doesn't have that much RAM. And when the memory fills up, sometimes it crashes and it stops the video. So I'm hoping with a low resolution, we will have fewer crashes. Um, but uh, if you guys ever look back and you see, so when it's playing right now, it's just got a dot. But if there's other buttons and widgets on there, that means it stopped recording. So the goal is to try and prevent that, so we have continuous videos. Okay, so what we're gonna talk about uh, to start off today uh, is we're going to rewrite the uh, energy balance uh, and just kind of simplify it for a couple of different systems that we'll really commonly see. Uh, and then it will apply directly to the homework so we can figure out how much heat a process requires, how much work it requires, and how much you can get out, all that kind of stuff. So, and then the same approach will be able to be taken by the entropy balance, but we'll just focus on the energy balance. So the general starting point that we're going to focus on uh, for energy balances in this class is going to be the rate of change of the total energy in the system as a function of time, du dt, is going to be equal to the rate at which energy enters the system in the form of enthalpy. So we're going to sum up every individual stream. We're going to take its mass flow rate times by its specific enthalpy. Now you could also rewrite this as molar flow rate times by n dot times by h underbar, just trying to keep the notation consistent. But the general idea here is that everything has to be in the same units. This is energy per time, this is energy per mass, and this is mass per time. So you times the two together, we get energy per time, or power. I tend not to think about it in terms of power, um, but the units work out that way. I tend to think of it as energy per time. Plus the total amount of heat energy coming into the system. I don't have a summation here, but just know that if you have lots of heat input streams, you would have multiple contributions from the cube. And likewise, we have work either going in or out of the system. Now this work term can be either shaft work or volume expansion work. Oh, one, one, one note. I did make a mistake, and I knew I was going to make this mistake. In the gravitational potential energy term, when we, when we break this up here, and we have that m times by this phi for gravitational potential energy, uh, I had it messed up. Rho GH is what I was messing with. This gives us pressure. MGH gives us energy. So for gravitational potential energy, this is just equal to GH. I messed that up in the, uh, the notes, I think, on the first, first day of class or second day of class. I don't remember which one. But I wanted to clarify that. All right, so a couple of simplifications that we're going to see very commonly. Now, this is the general starting point. Again, so anytime you're working on a homework problem or an exam problem that has to do with an energy balance, write this down. This is going to be always going to be your starting point. So we're going to simplify it a little bit. So if you have a closed system, what do we simplify? Closed. There'd be no mass going across the boundaries. Yep. All the mass flow rates are equal to zero, so the equation simplifies. Now if we integrate this expression over time, we just draw a little integral, and this is why thermal math is so nice and fun, du dt just becomes delta u 
Q and W. This would be the differential form of the closed energy balance equation. This would be the integral, integral form of the closed energy balance equation. Now in this case, it, we would write this as U2 minus U1, that is delta U. Now I just write two, meaning this is state two. So this is whatever temperature, pressure, enthalpy, entropy, whatever combination of variables that we classify as state two, we have to find a way to calculate its internal energy or look it up. So if, you have, if this is water, you could just look up whatever U2 is as a function of temperature and pressure. Same thing for the initial conditions. And this is how we can typically solve for the heat or for the work. Now if we say it's open and steady state, what do we say is equal to zero in this general balance equation? This term goes to zero because steady state means there's no change as a function of time. So anything that's over t, little t of course time, goes to zero. So in that case we would say that du dt is equal to zero, but the rest of the equation stays the same. I'm also not writing any subscripts, but you could also call it you know, stream i, mass flow rate of i, enthalpy of i, all that stuff, blah, blah, blah. So I'm just truncating that for simplicity. So for a lot of systems, this is as far as you can simplify it down. If you have multiple streams in, but only one stream out, it's kind of hard to set up a delta h. But let's look at a simplified system. With just one stream in and one stream out. So we have a mass flow rate stream coming in, a mass flow rate stream coming out. We potentially have a heat coming in and a work coming into the system, just to keep it general. This is a simplified system. So this would be a boiler or a condenser or some other type of system like this. So what we would write then is we would apply this equation here. Zero is equal to the mass flow rate in times by the enthalpy in minus the mass flow rate out times by the enthalpy out plus the rate of heat going in plus the rate of work going in. This of course could be in and out. Since this is open and steady state, if we apply a mass balance, dm, dt, right, the overall change of mass in the system as a function of time has to be equal to zero, zero because we have an open steady state process. So we have the mass flow rate in minus the mass flow rate out is equal to zero, and so mass in is equal to mass out, but I'm sure we all could have deduced that without explicitly writing down the material balance. This process is still useful because when the systems get more complex, it may not be as trivial to piece things together. So we can take this expression, we could rewrite it. Zero is equal to m, let's call it m because it's the same in and out, h in minus h out plus our heat plus our work. So commonly what we do in these expressions is we'll move this to the other side of the equation and we'll write it as m dot delta h where the delta h is um, out minus in. So this is, this is oftentimes where we get this confusing piece of information where we say, oh, it's a closed system. Oh, well, you should use delta U. Oh, it's an open system. Well, now you've got to use delta H. But it's not necessarily always going to be that straightforward. Because this work term right here, if you do this closed system at constant pressure, this work term turns into a P delta V. When you move that over to the other side, then you get delta H. So it's not always as simple as closed system is delta U, open system is delta A. <coughs> this ability to write the energy balance in this compact form, where we say that delta H is equal to Q plus W, that's only possible 
when we have a system that's as simple as this one here. But if we had a process, for example, that had three streams in and one stream out, there's no way we can find a, define a delta H. We would just have to keep this full open form. You would have one, two, three streams in and one stream out. How do you guys feel about energy balances? We can go through exactly the same procedure and simplifications for an energy balance as well. If it's adiabatic, Q is equal to zero. If it's steady state, du dt is equal to zero. If it's closed, mass and molar flow rates are zero. And so we can do the same thing for the entry balance. How do you guys feel about simplifying the general balance equations? All right, let's do an example then. Carnot cycle. The Carnot cycle consists of a cold reservoir, a hot reservoir, some process or some device that extracts energy and produces work. So the Carnot efficiency, we're going to call it eta, oops, Greek letter eta, and we're going to define it as the rate of work production divided by the amount of heat energy put into this engine. We, we call this a heat engine. So, I will be calling on random volunteers. Work out the energy balance and the entropy balance for this process and see if we can derive, oh, sorry, QH, pretty more specific here. See if we can derive an expression for the Carnot efficiency just based on what we've done so far. So let's write out the entry balance as well. So the two balance equations we're going to start off with, du dt is equal to summation m dot h hat plus q plus w. Again, we can have many q's and many w's. ds dt is equal to summation of m dot s hat plus q dot over t plus s gen. And I'll give you guys a hint. We're going to say this is equal to zero because this is the maximum efficiency maximum theoretical efficiency, assuming we've got 100% perfect, uh, no friction, no gradients, no nothing, which of course we know is not possible. That would take an infinite amount of time. How would we transfer heat from, let's say, a flame exploding in a car engine to whatever the complex mechanical apparatuses we have for the pistons moving and getting the car going? Okay. Let's first focus on the energy balance. Take a moment, write out the energy balance, and I'm going to call on some victims to tell me what they came up with. <coughs> Simplified, rearranged, structured in whatever way you find the most convenient in order to solve this problem. Who's got the energy balance? A few. Okay, let's walk through it a little bit quickly before. What's the system? The, the engine. The dot. Okay. What are some simplifications we can make to this expression? Uh, no flow rates. What else? And it's. And u over dt equals zero. Steady, steady yeah. state. Steady state. So, does anyone want to volunteer the energy balance? Okay, what do we got? Uh, QH equals to W plus QC. 
QH is equal to what? W walk walk plus QC. Yep. I would write, I think I have how I have it set up uh, for my solution is well actually I don't know how it let's keep it this way for right now. Okay. Check. Entry balance. What's the system? Engine. The engine. What can we simplify? Uh, no mass. No. Steady state. Yeah. So let's write out the entry balance. Yeah. Does someone want to just throw a shout it out? So Q -H. Q -H. Q -H. Q -H. is equal to Q C by B C. Q yes. And this is all we need to solve for the efficiency. So take a moment and play around with these terms and see if we can come up with an expression for that guy. Got it. Okay, let's walk through this then real quick. So the approach that I think I took as I solved for work uh, is equal to QH minus QC, right? It's the imbalance between how much heat goes in and there's two sources going out. Substitute in, solve this for QC, so Q dot C is equal to Q dot H over T H times by T C. Substitute that into here. Uh, we get Q dot H minus Q dot H times by T C over T H. Uh, pull out the uh, the QH and move to the other side. So then we get eta is equal to W dot over the heat in from the hot source, which is equal to one minus TC over TH. Bingo. So if we have a zero temperature for the rejection reservoir, we can get 100% efficiency. Or if we have an infinite temperature from our hot reservoir, we can get 100% efficiency. This is why you want to have your engine as hot as possible, but the limitation for power generation is typically going to be the material of construction. Uh oh. Sorry. Yeah. Let <laughs> me try to get this right again. Okay. So. Now what we've just done now with that example is effectively no different than what will be performed on the homework itself. Yes, question. Is it wrong to 
to say work goes the other way? No, I think it all should work out regardless of how you frame the question. I mean, it'll, it makes it... It would modify your energy balance here, potentially. Right. And so it changes the sign. It would, yes, and I believe what it would do it was it would, it, would, uh, it would redefine how you call your efficiency. So let's say we did change work to say going into the system, yeah. then we would want to define our efficiency as the work extracted, so then we would just call this the negative work. Because that's what we would care about, how much work we can pull out of the system. And then I think everything should propagate through just fine. We would just call this negative and then this would be negative and, and everything would kind of cascade into place. So, uh, in the homework, uh, problem one, I believe, if you guys have if you looked at it, more or less just says you have steam entering a turbine extractor. Uh, how much work can you get out of it if it goes from one state to a different state, right? I think that's the, the gist of the problem. We're doing nothing more complicated than what we just did right now, right? It's a steady state open process. This term goes to zero. I don't describe anything associated with how much heat is being lost by the process. So the Q is equal to zero. What we care about is the work term. We know the mass flow rate. So all we need to do is find a way to determine what the enthalpy in and out of the system is. The system under investigation is steam. So we just go to the steam tables. That's it. Right, so the manipulation of the energy balance is as trivial as what we just did in class. And hopefully this seems very straightforward. The only thing we're not doing is putting numbers in here. Now what we're going to be doing in the future is when we don't have the steam tables, calculating enthalpy. That's the real whiz bang of thermodynamics. What information do we need to measure? What is the minimum amount of information that we need to measure to be able to calculate the enthalpy of material at any given temperature and pressure? So the, the, the really great thing about Boltzmann's contribution to thermodynamics and why he's sort of credited as the founding father of statistical mechanics, kinetic theory of gases, atomic theory, is because by considering atoms or considering molecules as a possibility, as zipping around and containing kinetic energy, he was able to calculate the properties of superheated steam more accurately than anyone else ever could previously. So by employing this concept of an atom, that's how he was able to get really accurate predictions. And that was one of the real challenges of the Industrial Revolution was how do we actually understand and predict these properties. Um, for example, let's say I'm trying to design a more efficient refrigeration cycle, or I'm trying to design a refrigeration cycle uh, that can um, cool something to a particular temperature and pressure. Do you just want to try every material under the sun, or can we somehow predict at what point a particular material will boil at at a certain pressure or at a certain temperature. And so that's really the cool power of thermodynamics is to extract that information. Okay. So that is uh, more or less where we're going to end it in terms of system balances. Right, we're going to have, in the homework, you're going to have some closed systems, right? So we're going to simplify this down here. We're going to have some open systems. But now what we're going to do is instead of focusing on the balance aspect, we're still going to do balances, but it's going to be, they're not going to look like balances. But it's going to be a way that we can uh, restructure internal energy, enthalpy, entropy into units of temperature, pressure, volume. Those are things that we can actually measure in the laboratory. We can't measure in the laboratory enthalpy. We can measure heat, but we can't necessarily measure enthalpy. Uh, so we have to use the first and second laws in order for us to take stuff that we can measure in the lab and then convert it into something that we can uh, actually use and apply from fundamental thermodynamics. Okay. So what we're going to talk about now is Helmholtz and Gibbs energy.
So these are derived uh, based on more or less similar to what we've just done, but with specific systems. So Helmholtz, uh, which we write as A, for the derivation we're going to focus on a closed isothermal constant volume system. Oftentimes you'll see this written as NVT, <coughs> letting us know these are the three variables of the universe, and the universe that we're considering is the system, where we've got a box where the volume is constant, we have work coming in, and we have heat coming into the system. So we're going to call this an NVT system. So this is our universe. These are the variables that we are considering that are going to be changing. We're going to write out the energy balance. This is the integral form, or delta U is equal to Q plus W. We're going to write out our entropy balance. For now, we're not going to consider entropy generation, just for simplicity. Rearrange the entropy balance. Q is equal to T delta S. And we're going to substitute these together. Many of you can probably already see where this is going. I'm going to call it reversible work because we're assuming that the entropy generation is going to be zero in this case here. And we derive, and rather we define the Helmholtz energy as U minus TS. We can also write this instead of the delta, just say A is defined as U minus TS, or DA is equal to DU minus T. All of these are valid definitions of the Helmholtz energy. Actually, you know what? I'm not, not, I think we might define it based on FDSDT, so I'll hold off on that one yet. So for a real system, the shaft work extracted If we are having entropy generation, like we didn't consider this term, if we had propagated the entropy generation throughout the whole process, this reversible work is that expression right there. We would have to include this TS gen term. Now, for this particular system here, the way that the Helmholtz is derived classically, right? we could, of course, if we really wanted to, we could call this as U plus T delta S, but it would also vary how we define things. Uh, but basically, how we have derived the Helmholtz energy classically here, we have work going into the system. So if we have, oh, sorry, this is greater than zero always. 
if we have entropy being generated, negative work is what we want. So with positive terms here, we get less negative, which means we're getting less work out of the system. A little bit confusing with the sign convention. But the biggest negative number here is the one we want. And if we're adding a positive term to the negative number, we're getting less work out of the system. Uh, so oftentimes you'll hear that the Helmholtz energy is the reversible work that can be extracted from a constant volume system. Which is strictly true, but we don't really care too much about this definition. What we care about for the Helmholtz is it has much more power in its ability to predict phase behavior for constant volume systems. But in its definition originally, it is the reversible work that could be extracted from the system. Um, but later on what we'll find is that there are a lot other cooler properties of the Helmholtz energy and the Gibbs free energy. Uh, so this is for an NVT system. NVT. Now we can go through exactly the same derivation for the Gibbs free energy, but instead for the Gibbs free energy, it's not an NVT, it's an NPT system. So I'll just set it up just so we can see that the, uh, see the uh, interesting differences between the two. And then we'll just kind of skip to the final solution, not go through step by step. So for the Gibbs energy, just call it G. <clears throat> this is an NPT system. Closed, N is constant, P isobaric, P is constant, and T isothermal, the temperature is constant. So the differences between these systems then would be that the box or the system can expand and it can contract. Constant pressure, we have work coming into the system and we have heat coming into the system. So the main difference here, when we look at the energy balance, we have delta U which is equal to U2 minus U1. We have the heat into the system plus the work into the system minus P delta V. That's the work that's being removed from the system if it expands or the work being given to the system if it's compressed. So all that we're basically going to be doing here is combining these two terms together and say that delta H is equal to Q plus W. We're going to continue on with exactly the same procedure that we did just here. And then the final result is going to be definition of the Gibbs free energy. Where we call the Gibbs free energy the reversible work for an NPT system is equal to delta G, which we define as delta H minus T delta S. And we can also just generally define Gibbs free energy as H minus T S. Again, strictly true. The Gibbs free energy tells us how much work can be reversibly extracted from a particular process, but again, it is not the way that we really care to apply the Gibbs free energy. Um, and again, same thing also with uh, this complicated sign math here. If we do have entropy generation, it does make the work that we can extract smaller. Okay. I don't think we'll be able to get to the heavy hitting math. Um, we'll have to wait for Monday on that. But uh, in the last 15 minutes, I want to go over one other example that's going to be helpful for the homework. It's kind of a, a little bit of a grab bag class in terms of the content we're going to cover. Uh, let's see, do I have enough words they say? Probably. So in homework problem four, I want to say it is, I don't remember which problem it is. Uh, you have to tell us what the rate of entropy generation is for a particular process. Again, in the entropy balance, I've, I've, I've tried to make this clear. Don't, generally don't ever try to use this term. 
it's not particularly useful. Sometimes there may be an instance where it's useful, but for most of the types of questions that we're going to deal with with real processes, uh, you will not be using that term. You'll be finding a way to draw your system so you don't have to bother with it. Um, but what I wanted to go over is to play around and manipulate a little bit uh, the entropy balances and demonstrate how entropy is physically generated in real systems. So how is entropy generated? For this particular example, we're going to again do a simplified system. We're going to have a box with a barrier between the two. This box is going to be completely isolated. Lots of little dashed lines. So Q equals zero overall for this universe that we're dealing with. Uh, we're also going to say it's rigid walls as well. We're going to have two systems, A subsystem and B subsystem, and they're going to have their respective properties, <coughs> A and T, B. The only thing that we're going to allow to transfer in between these two processes here is Q. Now, one thing that's important for this derivation, that's not really going to affect the math too much, but you'll see why it's important after we get to the conclusion. We're going to say that the temperature inside compartment A is homogeneous, and the temperature inside compartment B is homogeneous. Now, how this can physically be possible is if the rate of heat transfer is slow, such that anytime some heat diffuses through this barrier, the thermal conductivity in this side is fast enough to cause the temperature to reach equilibrium, and the thermal conductivity in this side of the chamber is fast enough for the system to reach equilibrium. It just makes the math a little bit simpler. So let's do entropy balances. So we're going to do a entropy balance on the A side. A side S val. ds of A, dt, the entropy of side A, how it changes as a function of time, is equal to, now I've erased all of our entropy balances, but we're going to say, obviously there's no mass being exchanged. I didn't draw any arrows of fluorides going in and out of the system. We really care about uh, entropy generation. So the heat is the way that the process is going to be transferred and we potentially have some entropy generation. Now for our simplification, I said that the temperature is internally homogeneous on this side here, which means that we're going to say there's no entropy generated. We don't know that yet. The whole derivation is supposed to demonstrate that, but we'll see after the fact that that's what that means. So for this process, we're going to borrow from heat transfer. The rate of heat transfer uh, is going to be, so in this case here, Q dot minus H. Well, one side is going to be minus, one side is going to be plus. T A minus T B. Actually, this would be the way I've drawn the arrow. There'd be no minus sign there. T A. And then I made a mistake here. This has to be minus that. Because I've drawn the arrow leaving the system. It's negative heat. So my A side entropy balance expression is going to be minus H T A minus T B over T A, meaning that the greater the temperature difference, the greater the rate of heat transfer between those two barriers, which should be something that most everyone's comfortable with. Well, then I'm, I don't understand what the H is. Oh, H would be just a uh, uh, thermal uh, heat transfer coefficient, something like that. 
an overall heat transfer coefficient. Okay, so then is this TA squared in the bottom? Uh, oh, sorry, I made a mistake. Or there's no TA. No. There's no TA right here. I jumped the gun. I made a mistake there. Thank you. Okay, so that's all right. Yeah, this is just yeah. So this just makes the units work out. So whatever the temperature difference is, the larger the temperature difference, uh, the greater the rate of heat transfer. Yeah, understand. Okay. Yes, good catch. Uh, so on the B side, we'll do basically exactly the same thing, but signs will be a little bit different. Again, we're saying that there is no gradients inside of the system. It's homogeneous on the other side, so there's no entropy being generated on the inside. We'll see why that's the case when we get done with the derivation. Should be the same, just mirrored because the heat's going from one to the other. Now, of course, if we screw this up, we don't know if TA or TB is higher, but as long as we're consistent based on how we've drawn the arrow for our heat, it all should work out just fine. It's a very generalizable expression. Now, let's do the total entry balance. Let's see the total entropy balance. So I'm going to draw a lasso around my entire universe. What do I write here? Let's, let's write it out very generally. There's no mass going in and out of the system. So I'm just going to come up with some other Q term. I'll call it a Q prime, right? Because this is the Q going for the universe. Which of these goes to zero? That goes to zero because we're saying this universe is perfectly insulated. So for our purposes, the change of the entropy of the total combined system as a function of time is only the rate of entropy generation. And this is going to be true for the entire universe as well. The other key property to consider here is that entropy is extensive. The more mass a system has, the more entropy it has. If I have two buckets, A and B, I can add together their individual entropies, as long as they stay isolated. If they mix, then you have entropy generation, which is something we'll talk about on a different day. So that means we can write ds dt, the change of entropy for the total universe as a function of time, is just the change of entropy for system A as a function of time, plus the change in entropy of system B as a function of time. This is just the property of entropy that it is an extensive quantity. Mass carries with it entropy. That's all we're saying basically in this expression right here. So if we do our substitutions, we can find that the rate of entropy generation is equal to what we have derived previously So I'm going to skip over the math a little bit, but basically what we're going to do is cross, multiply, and then factor. So instead of doing the cross multiplication and the factorization, we'll just show that this is equal to Conclusion, the nice summary. So the conclusion of this little derivation of a simplified system is that 
the rate of entropy generation is directly related to the temperature difference between these two boxes. Now you could always, of course, go through a very similar derivation with, I think, much more complexity and tedium to demonstrate that concentration differences, <coughs> pressure differences, uh, any gradient that you can conceivably consider will generate entropy. So the only way that you can conduct a process that is reversible, meaning that the entropy generation rate approaches zero, is for every gradient in the system to equal zero. And this is why we could say that the rate of entropy generation inside each of these two boxes was zero, because we said that it, we given them a very, very long time to reach thermal equilibrium on the inside. But if I had a temperature gradient inside of compartment B and inside of compartment A, I would have to keep these terms. I wouldn't be able to say that they were equal to zero. Make sense? So entropy is generated by gradients. So if I have two beakers filled with water and they are on a hot stir plate, they both start off at room temperature. This stir plate, I'm trying to get it to, let's say, 70 degrees C for a particular reaction that I'm doing in the lab. All right, that's my goal. So let's say T end is equal to 70 degrees C. All right. I'm trying to get my water to that temperature. I turn this one on and I'm very, very, very patient. I say, you know what, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna set this to 70 degrees C and eventually the water's gonna reach that temperature. This one, I'm gonna say, I'm impatient. I'm gonna crank this thing up to 150 degrees C. And then once I hit 70, I'll play around with the temperature a little bit. Which of these two is going to be generating more entropy? Um, this one here. So the more impatient you are, the more entropy you generate. But unfortunately, we live in the real world with time as a real constraint. So if I'm operating a power plant, Yes, I care about the rate of entropy generation, but I care a whole lot more about the economics of the process. Sure, I could, be a, I could make my power plant much more efficient, but is the most efficient chemical plant the, uh, the most profitable chemical plant? And the answer is almost certainly why it's definitely not. Right, because if we were to consider this system here, technically, this water will never reach 70 degrees C. It'll get close. So if we were to consider a plot of the temperature of that water versus time, we would have an asymptotic line here at 70 degrees. And it would shoot up rapidly at first, but it would logarithmically or exponentially sort of approach that point right there. So in order for me in the lab to heat this water up to 70 degrees C, I would have to wait an infinite amount of time to truly get it to be 70 degrees C. In a chemical plant, that means every heat exchanger that I have, every reactor that I have, would have to be infinitely long, consisting of an infinite amount of metal, infinite amount of material, and an infinite pressure loss, meaning it makes no sense to do that on a practical term. So we do always have to sacrifice a little bit of efficiency in order to actually do real processes. For most everything that we're going to be concerned with, we're not going to be doing much real processes. Because chemical engineering thermodynamics focuses much, much more on phase equilibrium behavior. So even though there is always going to be entropy generation, it's very tricky to calculate. Right? We can really only get out to it from relatively simplified systems. So analytical expressions of the rate of entropy generation, we can only get in really simplified systems. We can determine the rate of entropy generation by applying an open system entropy balance very cleverly. And you'll see that on your homework, you'll have to calculate the rate of entropy generation. And this problem can be very difficult or it can be very straightforward if you choose your systems well. In this case, we did an entry balance on system A, we did an entry balance on system B, and we did an entry balance over the total system. If you don't know what to do, that's always your best starting point. Do energy balances on every system, every way you can draw it.
And if you apply that on the homework, it should fall into place relatively straightforward. Because some of the systems, you'll reach a point where you can simplify it down, or you can neglect different terms. But depending on how you draw your system, it's going to make your, 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 your math complicated. Now, what we really care about uh, in, in this class is more or less, we care more, not about the process, but about the state changes in the properties. Because across a phase transition, and this is sort of just looking for and setting it up, delta G is equal to zero. So the Gibbs free energy of a saturated liquid is equal to the Gibbs free energy of a saturated vapor. That's what we really care about. When it gets to multi-component, the expressions get a little bit more complicated. We use a term called partial fugacity, or the fugacity. But in this case, we define Gibbs as H minus Ts. So as chemical engineers, when we approach thermodynamics, we're not the ones that are the heavy lifters designing power plants, designing heat exchangers, designing pumps. Our heavy lifting in thermodynamics is telling people, if you mix this polymer with this solvent, this is how much is going to dissolve. If you boil this mixture of ethanol, methanol, propanol, this is what the composition of your vapor stream is going to be. If you mix these two liquids <coughs> together at this temperature, they'll phase separate following a spin-odal decomposition mechanism. That's what chemical engineers specialize in in terms of thermodynamics. No other discipline does that process. So in our terms, what we really care about is how can we accurately predict H, S, U, P, T, all these different terms. How can we accurately predict these quantities? Because we want to be able to predict H, we want to be able to predict S. From that, we can calculate the Gibbs free energy and determine information about the phase transitions. Enthalpy and entropy are state functions. It doesn't matter how we get to a particular state. So every time in our math and our calculations, we're going to choose a path where the entropy generation is zero because it makes our lives easier. It's a really tricky, complicated term to handle. So if we don't care about the time or energy or effort it takes to get from one state to the other, we just really want to know its properties. We're going to choose a path that takes infinite amount of time because on paper, we can do the math very quickly. And that's really the goal of what we're going to be accomplishing now is coming up with expressions to calculate these quantities to answer phase behavior questions through paths that are reversible. So a lot of the paths that we're going to take are going to be isentropic paths or gradientless paths, so we don't have to worry about entropy generation. So we're going to just artificially design everything that we do to make the math as simple as possible, because our goal is to get to this point right here and to apply it for very complicated systems. All right, any questions on what we're, the vision, I guess, of what we're going to be doing over the next couple of weeks? Cool, one week down. All right. See everyone on Monday. Have a good weekend. Oh, and one last thing. Uh, barbecue, welcome back barbecue, is right now. I think it technically starts at 11, so I don't know, go get a drink of water or something like that. Um, but on the, what is that, the southeast side in between the Merrill and the Warnock, that's where we're going to be having the, the barbecue. So please, please show up.